Hello, welcome to chapter eight of Foundations and Applications of Humanities Analytics. Though we did see some applications in chapter five in Simon's Capitalism and Democracy project, today I'm gonna to be talking you through a full application, including with some introduction to coding techniques of humanities analytics. I'm gonna be focused on linkages between feminist philosophy and mainstream ethics. And what follows, I'll talk a little bit about why I'm interested in those linkages and how we might go about studying them. So I'm a philosopher, my PhD is in philosophy, um, and philosophy is among the oldest academic disciplines. If you know nothing else about philosophy, you probably know that. And the earliest practice of logic and related formalizations of thought, which you might think of as sort of, you know, sufficient for saying, okay, this is, these are people doing philosophy. That emerges, as far as we know, simultaneously in Greece, India, and China in around the 6th century BC. It was likely going on in other places and likely going on before this, but this is sort of what we know. Now, very unfortunately, the history of philosophy, like the history of much of human civilization, is a history of sexism, male chauvinism, and misogyny. Um, throughout most of the time in which philosophy has been practiced, women have been systematically excluded from the practice of philosophy. And much more unfortunately still, while the situation in philosophy has gotten better, it has not gotten much better. Since the 1980s, the percentage of philosophy PhDs going to women has been stagnant at around 25%, which is not very good when you consider that the population is obviously 50% women, if not a little bit more. And moreover, it's not very good when you compare it to other cognate disciplines, disciplines like psychology um, or literature, the study of religion, et cetera. All of those fields have much higher rates of women, much closer to parity um, than philosophy does. So this is, this is really a problem. And I think it's in this context that feminist philosophy emerges as this sort of sub-discipline within philosophy worthy of very special concern, I think. So I really like this quote from Noel McAfee from her entry on feminist philosophy in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, in which she says the following, while students and scholars could turn to the writings of Simone de Beauvoir, a French theorist um, pictured here, or look back historically to the writings of first wave feminists like Mary Wollstonecraft, also pictured here, most of the philosophers writing in the first decades of the emergence of feminist philosophy brought their particular training and expertise to bear on analyzing issues raised by the women's liberation movement of the 1960s and 70s, such as abortion, affirmative action, equal opportunity, the institutes of marriage, sexuality, and love. So I, I like this quote for two reasons. One, it takes this very broad idea of feminist philosophy and really narrows it down a bit more to size by saying, look, you have this specific um, historical event women's liberation movement in a lot of uh, countries that happened in the 1960s and 1970s. And you have a specific intellectual um, engagement with that movement using the techniques of philosophy. And that is what we wanna call feminist philosophy for these purposes. And the second thing I like about it is that it really locates feminist philosophy very much in the space of ethics, right? It says it's interested in things like abortion, affirmative action, equal opportunity, marriage, sexuality, and love. This is ethics and political philosophy really as the sort of um, foreground of uh, feminist philosophical concern. And that's gonna come up again in this lecture. Now, even though that, that's happening in the 60s and 70s, it isn't until the 1980s that the first journal dedicated to feminist philosophy is launched. This is the journal Hypatia, right? So it was first envisioned during regional meetings of the Society for Women Philosophy in the 70s. And it's founded by Aziza Alhibri in 1982, but just as a special issue of Women's Studies International Forum. So at this point, you know, it's still not a journal in its own right. It's just a special issue of a journal dedicated to women's studies more generally rather than just philosophy. But in 1986, it becomes a standalone journal and it's regarded today as very likely the leading academic journal focused on feminist approaches to philosophical topics in both the continental and analytic traditions. Um, some of you may be aware of this, some of you may not, but philosophy is really divided still into two sort of broad approaches a continental approach, which comes um, out of people in the early 20th century like Searle and Heidegger, um, and an analytic approach that comes, um, comes about also in the early 20th century by people like Bertrand Russell, Ludwig Wittgenstein, et cetera. And the continental approach tends to engage more um, with literature and other works of art also takes a very sort of um, uh, 
introspective, almost Freudian understanding of psychology uh, to bear very seriously on philosophical issues. Uh, whereas the analytic tradition tends to be much more focused on the interactions of philosophy with areas like mathematics, logic, uh, science, to characterized by an almost hyper-rational kind of worldview. Um, continental philosophy, as fits its name, much more common in continental Europe. Uh, analytic philosophy, much more common in Anglophone countries, so UK, um, the US, Canada, Australia, etc. Hypatia is publishing feminist work in both of these spaces. I think that's important to note here. Um, and it's named after Hypatia of Alexandria. She's an ancient Greek woman. She's a polymath. She is a philosopher. You know, I was saying before, you know, the history of philosophy, and it's true, the history of philosophy is a history of systematic exclusion of women, but it does not follow from that that there were no women philosophers. And I de indeed, Hypatia was one of them. Uh, she was murdered by mob violence in uh, 415 AD, a really fascinating historical um, episode in some ways, you know, that it seems as though it may have been due to sort of a disagreement over the proper calculation of the date of Easter, as well as sort of pagan Christian antagonisms in late antiquity. Can't get into all of it here, but definitely, definitely very fascinating to read more about. So with this in mind, we can pose the following research question, which is as follows. To what extent have the interests, concerns, and techniques popular within feminist approaches to philosophy made their way into the mainstream of the discipline, especially within analytic philosophy? And that's what I'm going to be interested in here. You know, how have these distinctively feminist ways of doing philosophy influenced the analytic mainstream in the Anglophone world? So here's the methodology I'm going to use to do that. First, I'm going to scrape from the internet all the abstracts from the journal Hypatia from its founding in 1986 through to 2015. Then I'm gonna scrape abstracts from the journal Ethics. I'm choosing this journal because as I said before, feminist philosophy has largely been concerned with ethics and political philosophy. I think if you ask most um, philosophers working in the Anglophone world, what's the leading Anglophone journal of political and moral philosophy, they'd very, be very likely to respond either with philosophy and public affairs or ethics. And for a number of different reasons, I'm choosing to look specifically at ethics. I think you know it, it really typifies a kind of detached uh, analytic approach to questions of sort of um, morality and politics. And so in that sense, it's a really good benchmark for saying, look, you know, to the extent to which kind of non-mainstream views are making it into the journal ethics, they've really made it into the analytic mainstream at that point. And I'm gonna look at that journal from 1992 to 2021. And this is to allow for some lag time, right, a sort of six year lag for concepts from Hypatia to make their way into ethics. I'll extract the 100 most common words from the ethics corpus. I'll do the same thing for Hypatia, but then remove those words that are also in the list of 100 most common words in ethics. So I'll be left with a smaller list of words in Hypatia that removes those words that are common in both Hypatia and ethics. I'll then manually group the words in both lists into salient groupings. I'm not calling them topics because that has a distinct uh, meaning that we'll talk about more in the next lecture or Simon will talk about more in the next lecture on topic modeling. So I'll just call them groupings, right? And this is just me looking at the words and saying, okay, what are some sort of uh, categories of words, clusters that we can chunk these words up into? And then finally, I'll calculate the linkage between each of the words in the ethics grouping and um, the Hypatia grouping within the ethics corpus, I'll look at how are these groupings coming together within a mainstream analytic corpus so that we can see how the feminist concepts are making their way into the mainstream analytic ethics discussion. Right. So I'll pause here at this point to talk a little bit about how we're actually gonna do some of this scraping. So let me leave PowerPoint for one second. Where do we want to go for um, getting abstracts for philosophy journals? Where it well, it turns out there's a very good place to go, and it's a website called Phil Papers. philpapers.org. David Chalmers and David Bourget kind of uh, have created this incredible repository of philosophy papers going back decades, spanning every area of philosophy. It's really an incredible resource 
and a really great one for the profession. And it's great for people like me who want to do humanities analytics projects on philosophy corpora, right? So we're in fill papers. It's, it's got all these papers. What do we want? We want the papers that are in Hypatia. So we're going to search for Hypatia. And great, the journal pops right up. So we go to the journal page, and now we're looking at years, right? So let's go back to the first year of publication, 1986. That's going to take us to this web page. Right? And look, it's got exactly what we need. It's got all of the abstracts for all of the papers published in Hypatia in 1986. So what do we do now? Well, the next thing we're going to do is figure out, OK, how are these abstracts being stored within this sort of HTML representation of this website, because that's going to be really important for allowing a computer to go in and find those abstracts. So if we hit control click, might be right click on your browser. Different browsers might have slightly different ways of doing this, but any browser should be able to find you the HTML code for a web page. And we click view page source. Now it's going to open up a new tab, and here's our HTML. Now we're interested in where are the abstracts within this sort of raw representation of the data in this web page. And one way to do that is to try and look for them. So let's do control F, abstract. And we start by getting some things, okay, hide abstracts. That seems to be related more to a link that you might click to hide the abstracts. That's not what we want. Get that a few more times, hide abstracts, hide abstracts, until boom. We've gotten to a point where it looks like we're actually looking at an abstract, right? So this review examines H. Tristram Engelhardt Jr.'s Foundations of Bioethics, a contemporary non-feminist text. So that's an abstract. That's what we want. And you notice here that just before the abstract, there's this HTML tag that says div class equals abstract. So now we know how this web page is categorizing abstracts. It's putting them in a particular div class, which is a kind of uh, a, a class of data that's included on this web page, and it's calling that class abstract. So that's pretty fantastic, right? And then we notice at the end of the abstract, you see this backslash div, and that's to let you know that the abstract is over, right? So a computer can go in now, and we can tell a computer exactly where to look for the abstracts, and that's what we're going to do. So if we open Anaconda Navigator, um, I would encourage all of you to download Anaconda Navigator. It's free. It's a really great way of sort of getting started in Python programming, making Jupyter notebooks, doing all kinds of things, really. So I'll launch Jupyter Lab. And Jupyter Lab is a really nice way of sort of writing Python code in a way that's easy to chunk up, easy to take in steps, easy to understand. If you're not using Jupyter Notebooks now and you're interested in Python, I would encourage you to start by using Jupyter Notebooks. It's how I got started. I'm not a programming expert. I'll talk more about that in a bit. And I found Jupyter Notebooks to be extremely helpful. So just a few lines of code here, right? So the first thing we do is from this package BS4, we're importing something called beautiful soup. And beautiful soup is really, I've found a really nice way to do scraping from web pages in Python. We'll also import numpy, which is your sort of very common sort of data analysis package used all the time in Python. And then we'll import a package called requests. So we've got those three. And then we'll just sort of set the URL to exactly the URL we're interested in which is the URL of this web page right here, the web page containing all of the Hypatia abstracts from 1986. Then we'll use this request function to sort of grab that URL, put it in an object called R. Then we'll feed the text in that object R into a beautiful, the beautiful soup function and tell it to parse that as HTML and then save the parsed HTML as soup, right? So just calling that soup. Now we create an object called abstracts and tell us and tell Python to go through that object soup that we just created and find all of the div classes with the title abstract, right? Because that's where the abstracts are. That's where, it's, that's where this web page is storing the abstracts. 
And then we turn that object abstracts into a numpy array because that's going to make it easier to analyze. We then save the text of the abstract in a text file, open it up again, and then use beautiful soup again to just clean up some of the HTML tags so that the abstracts that we do have don't have any residual HTML in them. So that's it, it's 10 lines of code. And if we hit play, then it'll run the code. It's gonna be busy for a second. Now it's stopped running, it's idle. And in just a second, what we'll get is a text file containing the abstracts from 1986, and there it is. If we click on this, we can see that it's got exactly what we want. It's got, it's a text file where each line is an abstract from that year, 1986. So that's all we had to do. It really just takes a little bit of sort of digging around in the HTML of a web page, figuring out how that web page is storing the particular data that you need, and then using beautiful soup, which again, in just a few lines of code, was very, um, very much able to extract these abstracts very efficiently and very quickly, right? So now let's go back to PowerPoint and back to the presentation, right? We ended up doing that scraping for all of the years in our study and building full corpora for both Hypatia and ethics. And once we did that, we were able to identify those hundred most common words, which were, which was what we sort of set out to do in the first place. And then, we could look manually at those 100 most common words and see which sort of salient groupings we wanted to pick out. And here are the groupings we arrived at. So for ethics, we start with our morality terms. And these are words like moral, ethics, value, right, wrong, morally, ethically, et cetera. Then we also get some political terms. Again, these are very straightforward, political, people, action, freedom, war is a little more specific, but justice, equality, et cetera. We see a lot of rationality terms. These are terms relating to what you might think of broadly as sort of kind of the, the mechanisms of rationality. So things like argument, reason, principles, thoughts, questions, etc. We see some philosophy terms, which I'm thinking here is specifically terms related to like the practice of philosophy. So terms like theory, views, work, as in like this work of philosophy, philosophers, cases, claims, etc. See a lot of those in the corpus and lump them all together. We see some normativity terms where normativity is just a study of how things ought to be, right? So normative ought, must, might, virtue, practical all sort of fall into there, I think. We see some decision theoretic terms, terms specifically related to how, how people make decisions. Agent, I think, falls into that category as this act, choice, actions, agency, et cetera. We see, interestingly, well, some of what I'm calling these naturalistic terms. These are, we saw three terms like this that we wanted to group together because they didn't really fit into any of the others. And they did have something in common, which is this idea of being about sort of nature. This is nature, also human and life, right? And then finally, we have one name in the 100 most common word groupings, 100 most common words in ethics. And that's the name of John Rawls, this sort of the famous moral and political philosopher of the 20th century. Um, so he gets his own category of historical figures. Now, here's the same, same groupings again, but for Hypatia, right? So we start with these core feminist concept terms, right? And these are the word, terms I think are really going to be distinctive of feminist concerns in, in, uh, in philosophy. So we have feminist, obviously, but then also woman, man, gender, feminism, feminists, etc. We also have some sex and sexuality terms, and here I'm including sexual, sex, and lesbian. Sex is a tough one, right? Because you might think it's referring in some cases to biological sex, in some cases referring to you know, sex as in you know, having sex. Um, I've lumped it in with sex and sexuality here for these purposes, right? We've also got some terms that are also you know, sort of broad philosophy terms, but I think of them more as distinctly feminist, and indeed they're not included in the 100 most common words in the ethics corpus, but they are for Hypatia. So I've called them sort of feminist philosophy terms. And here you do notice, you know, words like critique and critical, examine, um, analysis, et cetera, come out more here, suggesting a kind of more critical lens, distinctive of feminist philosophy. And I think that is accurate. Uh, next, we have some politics terms, again, that aren't included in the ethics corpus, at least not in the 100 most common words but are in the feminist corpus is most hundred common words. And these are political terms like identity, power, cultural, race, oppression, et cetera. So again, I think you know, power 
comes up both in this, you know, use of just the word power, but then also in the terms violence, oppression, etc. And identity comes up here, both in the word identity itself, but also in terms of race and a national identity, in this case, American. So again, I think an accurate uh, idea that there's a distinct focus in feminist politics and political philosophy on issues both of power and identity. Right? Finally, we see these rationality terms, again, distinctively feminist rationality terms, um, knowledge, relations, relationship, thought, science appears in this corpus, does not appear in the 100 Most Common Words in the Ethics Corpus. Um, psychological terms, these didn't appear in the 100 Most Common Words in the Ethics Corpus, but they're very common in the feminist corpus. Um, this is understanding, experience, love, and self. Um, and love is a particularly interesting one, I think, and I'll touch on that a bit more later on. And finally, we've got these historical figures, uh, Simone de Beauvoir and Irigaray, um, both you know, major feminist historical figures in the 20th century, um, both in the 100 most commonly used, used words in Hypatia. And note that all of this grouping was done manually. I went through the list of common words and made these groups based on my understanding of the domain from which the words were pulled. You know, I did not use any machine assisted tools. And indeed, I think that's what's distinctive about the humanities analytics approach is that even though there's a lot of machine assist involved in this project, there's also a lot of me bringing my understanding of the field of philosophy to bear on this data in order to sort of even facilitate the computer assisted analysis. So there's this real back and forth between domain expertise and computational power that's going on in the, even in this simple study. So now that we've got these groups, we can calculate the linkages between a group. And the first thing we do is calculate the frequency of a group's words. And this is just the number of ethics abstracts containing words in the group divided by the total number of ethics abstracts. And here notice we're looking at ethics abstracts because what we're interested in are the linkages between mainstream uh, ethics concepts and feminist concepts as they're occurring within the mainstream literature. So that's why we're looking at ethics, the ethics corpus to calculate our frequencies. We define the joint frequency, which is just the number of ethics abstracts containing words in either in both of two groups, group one and group two, divided by the total number of abstracts. And then we can take the linkage and the linkage between two groups here is gonna be the ratio between the joint frequency and the frequency with which the term occurs in group one, or sorry, the frequency with which words in group one occur in the ethics literature and multiplied by the frequency with which terms in group two occur in the ethics literature. And this ratio should be familiar to you. It's exactly the same mathematical form as Simon's R ratio from chapter five. The difference here is that rather than just looking at two words, capitalism and democracy, we're instead looking at whole groups of words and the linkages between those groups of words. But mathematically, it's the exact same thing, right? So when I was showing you the scraping, I just, I showed you some of the basic steps that we took from a coding perspective in order to implement this, this first part of our methodology, the scraping. In what follows, I'll walk you through some lightly commented code to show you how we completed the whole study, right? And the results that we ended up getting. Now, ultimately this is not a coding course, right? And if you're interested in really becoming expert in these things, which by the way, I'm not, you know, I'm, I, I'm only sort of um, uh, functional in a lot of these techniques, then it would be worth taking a different course or just practicing a lot. Uh, I have found in my experience that the best way to learn how to use these tools is to practice. And I think that's why I really wanna walk you through some of the code that we've done here, because I think it can be helpful in seeing, oh, I actually could get started on some of this stuff without a ton of technical knowledge beforehand, if you sort of just see it done once, right? And that's really what I'd encourage each of you to do if you're not sort of expert in coding already is to try and start practicing these things on your own more and more. Um, if you are, then in some sense, some of what I'm presenting is gonna be remedial. You might not even like everything that I'm doing, just ask you to bear with me. We'll have a fully commented code available as a GitHub link through the chapter overview that I encourage anyone who's serious about this stuff to look at. And ultimately, as I was saying before, you know, coding, at least for me, has always been a very much a learn by doing endeavor. 
I use Google a lot. I use Stack Exchange a lot. If I'm running into a problem, there's a good chance someone else has run into it before and they've put it up on the web, which makes it really great, uh, really great resource for troubleshooting all kinds of things that go wrong. Now, the reality is that in much of science, you know, including humanities analytics, but also the natural sciences, the social sciences, scientists are writing code that's that's messy and, and very imperfect. And you know, a, a sort of enterprise data scientist or a software developer might sort of balk at how scientists do things. But for the scientists, all that really matters is that it works. You know, it does not need to be perfect, and you do not need to, should not go into trying to start doing some computational work feeling like you need to be perfect. It just needs to run. So at this stage now, I'll walk through some of the code. So here's the full code for our, um, for our study. So the first thing we did is we imported beautiful soup as we did before, and we imp imported numpy as we did before. We then imported something called the natural language toolkit. And this is a really cool function that I think allows us, uh, sorry, a package that has all kinds of functions that allow you to sort of parse and deal with natural language. And I'll show you how we use those, those functionalities below. We imported networks, which uh, Zachary RTA turned me on to is a really good package for sort of building um, graphs, which is ultimately what we're gonna do here. We're gonna build a graph showing all the linkages between, um, between groupings in the data. And then finally, we imported something called matplotlib pyplot, which is a very common package used for visualizing sort of data building graphs and charts, et cetera. All right. So that's our import. Next thing we did is we got all the stop words that come out of the natural language toolkit, right? These are all these very common words words like if, and, the, but, et cetera, uh, that don't really give us much information. And so we'll want to remove them from our corpus. And those, that comes sort of for free with the natural language toolkit, which is nice. I don't mean for free as in money. This is all free from a monetary perspective. I mean, it just comes with it. Uh, then we added some other words we want, might, want to, might want to remove, right? So shrink was coming up a lot for some reason as part as like a sort of a link that you could click to shrink abstracts. We wanted to get rid of that. We also wanted to get rid of some punctuation, things like article, paper, chapter, philosophy, et cetera. Numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, just because they're really not relevant to our study. And then we sort of add those, um, add those, uh, those special stop words, what we're calling the other removals to our existing stop words. Then we did the same scraping as we did before, but we wanted to do all of the years, not just one year, 1986, et cetera. So we did use what's called a for loop to sort of loop through the range of years and then feed each year into this print, uh, percentage S here that we've put into the URL. And using just these two lines of code here, we make a year, the year equal a string, and then the string equal the URL within parentheses. So the URL equal the URL with the parentheses filled in with that string year. By doing that, we're able to essentially loop through and build each URL with the year that we want and scrape the data that we want from it, right? And this is really cool, right? Because it basically allows us to very quickly scrape a bunch of different web pages because we know what they have in common in terms of their URLs, right? So if we go to the full data here, you can see that we were able to build text files of each year of data, Hypatia 1986, 1987, 1988, all the way up to 2014, right? Now, once we've done that, we've sort of used beautiful soup to word tokenize them, make them all lowercase, save them as a text file, open up that text file and clean out some of the HTML tags, right? So that's very cool too. We do the same thing for ethics. And now, as you can see here as well, we have all of these years of ethics abstracts. And if you click on them, they look exactly like they should, just lists, uh, you know, lists of words. And what you can see here is that because we're removing the stop words, 
they're a little bit harder for a human being to read, right? Because they don't have all these common words like the and 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 if and but that we need to parse language. But it's better for the computer, right? Because now it no longer has these words that are informationally irrelevant. And that's better for us as researchers as well. So now what we want to do is combine all the Hypatia abstracts that we've just scraped out here into a single text file and do the same thing for ethics. And we've done that right here in this, in this chunk. Next, we're going to start, we're going to want to start counting up um, the words in each of these sort of files that contains the full corpus for both journals in order to find the 100 most common. So we start by doing that with ethics, open up the ethics file, read it in to Python, then use the natural language toolkit to tokenize all the words. So basically treat each word as an entity, you know, whether it's moral, political, um, rationality, war, etc. All these words become individual tokens within the corpus. Then we're able to count each word using just this natural language toolkit function called freak dist, frequency distribution. All right. What that's going to do is it's going to create an object, all ethics distribution, which has all the words in ethics paired with the number of times that that word appears in the corpus. Next, we extract the 100 most common words just by using this function most common, again, which comes with the natural language toolkit, very useful. And then because we still got each word sort of paired with a count, what we have to do is sort of remove those counts because ultimately we're not, we don't need to know how many times each word appears just as long as it's in the top 100. So we've done that as well, just with this line of code. And then we save the list of 100 most common words as a text file. Do the same exact thing for Hypatia. The only thing here now is that we're also going to remove words from the Hypatia most common list if they also appear in the ethics most common list, because ultimately we're not interested in those linkages. Right? Now, this is the point at which we go in and manually inspect both of those lists. So we look, we can look at ethics most common read through it. There's some we'll want to discard here, maybe may doesn't matter that much. Certainly these punctuations that, that the stop words couldn't catch, want to remove those. But we go through it and we just sort of make um, make groupings as we see fit, as I, as I saw fit in this study, right? So this is the human element coming in again. Once I've done those groupings though, I'll come back into Python and create arrays which contain strings, and you know that they're strings because they have quotes around them and they're red, with each of the words in each grouping, right? So you've got your morality terms, that's one array, your politics terms, that's another array, and so on, decision theoretic terms, et cetera. Then create an array with all of those arrays, with all of those groupings so that we can call on that in doing future work. Repeat the same thing um, for Hypatia, obviously. Then what we do, is we read the corpus with all the full ethics abstracts again, and we read them into an array so that each entry in that array is an abstract. We had this for each individual year, but we haven't had it yet for the full ethics corpus. And now we do with just this one line of code. So now what we've got, we've got, we've got our groupings, We've got our full corpus. What we need to do is calculate the linkages between each ethics grouping and each Hypatia grouping um, within that full corpus that we've got. The way we do this is we define some functions. The first function just takes the frequency of every um, of each with which words in a group appear within the ethics corpus. So this is going to be, you know, this function freak. So you're going to put a group name in there. So you could put in something like ethics naturalistic terms, right? And it will tell you the ratio between the number of abstracts in ethics that contain words in that group divided by the total number of abstracts in ethics. So that's getting you your frequency. Then we define a joint frequency function in much the same way, only now we're looking for um, 
abstracts that contain words from both of two groups that we input into the joint frequency function. And then finally, we use those two functions, joint frequency and frequency, to define the linkage function in just the way that we did in the PowerPoint that I was showing you earlier. Now, once we've done that, we can create a linkage matrix, which is going to be an eight by seven matrix in which each uh, row corresponds to a particular ethics grouping. Each column corresponds to a particular Hypatia grouping. And the entry, the row column entry, is the linkage between the ethics grouping and the Hypatia grouping, right? And all that takes is just a simple for loop in which we say for each number in the number of rows, the number of ethics groupings, build a row in which each entry, so each sort of column entry for that row, is the linkage between the ethics category that row corresponds to and the Hypatia category that that column responds to. And we do that across the row for all columns, right? And that's going to generate our sort of linkage matrix, right? So that, in a sense, that's our data. That's what we wanted to get. And now we've got it. And then the question becomes, can we represent this well? And here's where we bring in the networks package, right? So the first thing we do is create some arrays with strings that give us the names of each of these uh, categories. So all the ethics groupings and all the Hypatia groupings, we wanna save them as names so that they can be displayed within a sort of visual representation rather than sort of things like this with all these sort of, um, you know, subscripts and everything that, uh, that don't really, don't really, won't really look nice in a visual representation. So we write out all the names sort of proper um, proper uh, English, basically. And then we use the networks package to create the graph. So first we just create the graph. We just say G, that's our graph. And it's basically at this point, just an empty object. Then we start adding nodes, right? And we add the nodes from the category names, right? The ethics category names and the Hypatia category names, right? And so now we've got some nodes and the graph knows that they correspond to uh, these groupings that we've made, but that's all it knows. The crucial thing is that we're going to start adding aided wet, weighted edges between the nodes in the graph that represent the linkage between the two nodes, um, between the categories represented by the two nodes being connected by the edge, right? So what we're going to do is we create another for loop for each i in the range of ethics categories and each J in the range of Hypatia categories, you add a weighted edge between the I node and the J node, so between the ethics category and the Hypatia category, where the, the weight, the sort of number associated with that edge is just the linkage matrix between the linkage matrix entry. So the linkage between the ethics category and the Hypatia category. And then we're going to square those linkages because what we found was if you just took the linkages on their own and then tried to make the edges, the sort of connections between the nodes, thicker or thinner, depending on the linkage, if you just did the linkage on its own, the thickness and thinness wasn't enough to really tell a difference well. Whereas if you square it, you can tell those differences much more nicely. And so then the final thing to do is to just create a graph in which each word category is a node and the thickness of an edge between nodes just corresponds to, represents the value of the linkage between the word categories represented by the nodes being linked. And this is where I just turned to Google. I basically Googled um, networks. So that's you know, the package that we're using. Make a graph with where edge width or edge thickness denotes uh, edge weight, right? Or represents edge weight. And I was very quickly able to find some, some really good code that I could more or less just copy and paste, you know, mess around with a little bit, but not too much, um, that would do exactly that for me. And indeed, you know, I, I copy pasted pretty much all of this in and then ended up with this nice visualization of our data, of the connections between the groupings that we care about. And if we go back to PowerPoint, you can see this again. So here's that graph, right? You've got all your ethics categories, um, which are clearly denoted 
all your Hypatia categories, which includes denoted, and you've got these linkages between them, these weights, these edges between them, where the thickness of the edge uh, tells you the magnitude of that linkage. So in a sense, there was our research question. How have um, techniques, concepts from feminist philosophy made their way into the mainstream analytic ethics corpus? Here's your answer in some senses, right here in this graph with a little bit of parsing to tell you what the thickness of a node of an edge means, what a node means, et cetera. Just to pull out some key findings from this visual though, one thing I found very interesting is where sex and sexuality, which is you know, coming out of the Hypatia corpus, where that's discussed in mainstream ethics, it tends to be linked with moral rather than political language, right? We see the opposite for core feminist concepts. So whereas for sex and sexuality, the sort of the thickest um, edge into sex and sexuality is coming from morality, right? So you can see that as well. The way in which sex and sexuality is being incorporated into the uh, mainstream ethics corpus is through sort of discussion of the morality of sex and sexuality. And I think that, 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 that does ring true from what I know of this literature. Whereas some of these core feminist concepts you can see the thickest edge coming out of that node is right into the politics, uh, the politics grouping in the mainstream ethics corpus. There's also an interesting and strong link between the psychological terms like love and emotion and understanding, et cetera. They're more common in the Hypatia corpus. There's a link between those and this very interesting and naturalistic language like human and life used in the mainstream ethics corpus. So that suggests something really cool too, which is where, where feminist discussions of psychology are occurring in feminist philosophy or in mainstream philosophy literature, they're occurring in conjunction with uh, naturalistic discussions, ethical discussions of the natural. And, you know, I find that I find that something you know really potentially worthy of, of important future study. There are some linkages between mainstream historical figures, which remember in this case is just Rawls because that was the only historical figure that came up in our 100 most common names. Linkages there between feminist politics, feminist philosophy, feminist rationality there. So you do see um, some feminists uh, discussing Rawls and then uh, feminist discussions of Rawls making their way into the mainstream ethics literature. What you see no linkage at all is between feminist historical figures like Beauvoir and Irigare and any of the salient word groupings in the ethics corpus. This suggests that they just don't appear at all in the ethics corpus. So that's a more negative study that points to you know, the continued exclusion of women from mainstream philosophy is the extent to which these sort of really important figures in feminist philosophy are just not discussed at all in the mainstream ethics literature. So that's a, that's a more negative conclusion that comes out of this study, right? So, you know, on its own, this study is probably not publishable. You know, it just doesn't have quite the power, quite the sort of interestingness to really, uh, I think, really catch someone's eye. Um, but I think it points in the right direction, right? You know, first of all, I think if you wanted to do this as a publishable study, you might want to use a much larger corpus. So you can request from JSTOR full engrams of entire articles from journals rather than just abstracts. Uh, so we could do that for Hypatia and Ethics. We could also look for more journals. I think if we had that, we could start looking at more diachronic trends rather than just taking an overall snapshot of this sort of you know, 30 year period, 40 year period rather I should say. Um, we could, perhaps use some machine assisted topical grouping of words rather than simply just doing all that stuff manually. And indeed in his next lecture, Simon is gonna talk about just how you might do that using topic modeling techniques and how that feeds in nicely um, into some of the stuff that we've discussed here as well. You might also, if you go all the way back to our first guest lecture from Lauren Klein in the second week of this course, you'll remember that she had this uh, really interesting notion of semantic leadership where she was showing sort of leader follower networks between abolitionist newspapers. You might wanna do some of that here to look at sort of quantifying ways in which um, feminist literature is sort of leading the charge on certain discussions that are then making their way into the mainstream ethics literature or not, we don't know yet, but it might be interesting to bring some of those techniques to bear. But nevertheless, I think what I've done here in sort of getting a snapshot of at least what, what the linkages look like at some level is a good place to start for thinking about these issues in more depth.
So I'll just summarize what we've done here. I've introduced a research question about the influence of feminist approaches in philosophy on mainstream analytic ethics. I've outlined a basic methodology through which we could address those issues. And I've showed some of the basic scraping, coding, and domain expertise that needs to be deployed really to collect and analyze the kind of data that we're interested in here. I drew some conclusions from that collected data, um, including you know, some of the ones that we just discussed. And then I've noted some limitations of the study here and suggested some future work. So I'll conclude there. You know, I look forward to Simon's lecture next week in which we talk about how topic modeling can also be brought to bear in order to uh, address some of these same kinds of questions and some new questions as well. But uh, for now, you know, I thank you so much for listening and look forward to discussing this with you more in the Discord chat and look forward to your assignments. Thank you very much. And also thank you to Zachary and Simon, both of whom were extremely helpful in um, preparing this lecture from both a technical and conceptual perspective.